What don't you think? And you may need Marilyn to get fairly close to the okay. line. Well, maybe, right. it, maybe an inch away at the most. This is great. So okay. you're going to be reading a, a poem. I think I'm going to read oh, Cool. Let me just get my thing here. Sure. Right here. Back. Oh, no, oh, no. Pen, the cat. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay. You know, I think I'll leave. I think I'll leave the hat off. It'd just be easier, easier to read. Okay. You're gonna have to. Yeah. Oh, she got a little white bib. Yeah. You got a little white bib. She's so calm. Yeah. Very, very calm. good. Yeah. She's people. Yeah, she is. Yeah, she likes to walk on the computer. Get this all set. Marilyn, you look great. I look like Fred Flintstone. With the, <laughs> that is. Okay, you cats and kitty cats out there, this is Nick Beat, a great and powerful, and this is Hal, spoken word show that comes at you every Tuesday night from 10 to 11 p.m. on 89.5 FM CIUT, and also on the worldwide internet, heard all over the world at www.ciut.fm. So we have a, a, a really amazing guest tonight that I'm so pumped and super excited to have. I can't even believe that she's actually here. We have in the studio, Marilyn Lightstone. And before we talk to Marilyn, I'm going to let you know a little bit about Marilyn. Marilyn Lightstone was born in uh, Montreal, Quebec, Canada. She is a Canadian film, television, and voice actress. She starred on Canadian television in Anna Green Gables, Road to Avonlea. She has also won various voice roles in animated series. She's won two Canadian film awards. She's also a painter, a writer, formerly the brand announcer for uh, Canadian Arts Television Network Bravo. She has said she is still interested in acting, even on stage, but only when she would consider uh, meaningful roles of us. Right now, she has said she is currently interested mainly in painting and photography, and there is a beautiful picture of her on uh, Facebook or profile with, uh, with a camera that speaks to that. She currently hosts an evening program on Classical 96. And three is Nimer's Classical Music Radio Station in Toronto. That's Moses Nimer. And we're very pleased to have Marilyn here. Hi, Marilyn. Great to be here, Nick. Hi. It is. See? Isn't that a great haven't voice? Been, I haven't been on a university campus in many a year. It's such fun. What university did you go to? I went to McGill. And what was that like? Uh, well, I spent most of my time doing uh, university theater. It's really kind of where I, I realized I wanted to be an actress. And uh, luckily for me, during my last year at university, the National Theatre School opened up in Montreal. So synchronicity was uh, very much my good fortune that it worked out that way. The first time I saw you was in a Canadian film called Lies My Father Told Me, which is a wonderful performance. Thank you. That, that film actually got a lot of cachet, a lot of notice, uh, especially for you. What was it like working, working on that early film in, Can in Canadian film? Well, first of all, it was my first film. Well, that was, was my your first, first film, film, and it was a wonderful role and a wonderful script written by Ted Allen. And uh, the actors were all terrific. Lynn Berman played my husband. Uh, Yossi Yadin played the grandfather. That's right. uh, a little boy who was seven at the time, but playing a five-year-old, Jeffrey Linus, who is now in the business as well, but on the business end, uh, was the most extraordinary young actor that I'd ever come across. And um, it, it was thrilling for me. And um, 
being able to shoot also in my hometown and uh, on a set that really reminded me of, you know, where our Bubbies and Zadies and aunts and uncles used to live when we were small. Very, very real, very textures and altogether a very satisfying experience. What was Montreal like growing growing up? Back back in those times, what was it like? Well, I grew up uh, in what is now known, I believe, as the North End, I think. North Something, no, well, I think it's the North End. I'm not quite sure. Clark and Bernard, one, one street um, west of St. Lawrence Boulevard, the main. And uh, it was a um, mixed area, um, immigrants, Jewish immigrants mostly like myself, Scots people, Irish people, French Canadians. It was a, a real, real melange. We had a, a corner store named Lou's on the corner that everyone had an account with. And you go to the corner store sent by your mom and your dad and say, a bottle of kick, please, and put it on our account. and. Uh, very much the way we, we think about Montreal in those days as, as written by So can, can, can I ask you about, was, was there any anti-Semitism at all or was it fairly co cordial? Uh, well, it was very cordial on the one hand, but uh, of course there was anti-Semitism, is there ever not? Yeah, <laughs> that's a good point. Yes, yes, there, there was, but I really frankly didn't experience it until very much later in life and, and only a couple of times, but I heard stories from my dad about him, you know, getting into fights as a kid with, with gangs from, who called him names, etc. But um, no one in my house ever dwelled on it. Okay. This is Nick Beat on CIUT's Howl. Hope you're enjoying the show. It's Howl, which is spoken word. We're actually going to be hearing a little treat of spoken word that uh, Marilyn's actually going to read from my friend Penelope, who's also my videographer. Every show is vid videoed and put on YouTube, and which we will be doing later on. On and Marilyn, you're actually going to read something from Penelope's I am. book. Well, you know, I read poetry on my on my radio show. Um, when I first started to do the show, I thought I don't want to just announce what you're going to hear and what you've just heard, etc. I want to do a little value added, and uh, one of the things I love to do is to read poetry. So um, I do about six poems per night. And when I arrived here this evening, Penelope and I got to chatting, and she showed me her book, and she writes about her her animals, her cat. In this case, her cat named Fluffy. Mm -hmm. So uh, knowing that when I um, when I do the show, I find some of my best poems uh, are very often poems that have been written for children, or even sometimes by children. So I had to look through, and I thought, hey, why don't I just do a piece of Penelope's? So here we are. This is called yeah. Fluffy and the Refrigerator. There was place that Fluffy needed. It was a back scratcher. It was warm and dark and cozy. It hit all of these missed spots. Her person got upset for some reason sometimes. Fluffy, no, no, don't go there, she'd say. Well, Fluffy said, you don't know a thing. Fluffy just spread herself out from side to side. Her front legs went far, far out and pulled her forward. Her back legs went to the sides and scrabbled to push her in. She squirmed back and forth and was underneath, under the refrigerator. Ah, the dark hole. Ah, those metally swirly things scratched every inch on her back. Her person was a bit upset now. Fluffy turned and got a few more itches scratched. Ah, Fluffy said. Her head came out and she pulled the rest of herself out. Oh, Fluffy, you are covered in dust. Fluffy sighed happily as the dust was stroked off of her. This was a thing to purr about. There we go. Thank you, Penelope. Oh, thank you, Marilyn. And we have a little, I don't know if this is a Fluffy here. We have a wonderful little black kitten here that's just so Who's sweet. Who's destroying the studio at this very Perhaps, moment. Perhaps, but he's charming. This is, this is little, this is Tareen, right? Tareen, yeah. Tareen, okay. Yeah, she's, she's like oh, Fluffy's okay. reincarnation in a way. Tareen is, is sort of chewing on her, on her wire pen. I'm going to have to ask you to just take Tareen. All black except for a lovely white sort of longish streak down the belly. Really sweet. That was wonderfully done. I Thank love you. it. And, I mean, you just did it. I mean, I just. Gee, I know how to read. So do you, Nick. Yeah, I know sure how to read. I do announcing too. But I mean, that's amazing how you got into the. I mean, you actually did a character in a way while you were doing well, that. Well, the poem's full of characters: the the, the mistress and, and and of course Fluffy herself. It's true. And, uh, even the refrigerator has a bit of a character. <laughs> this is true. This is true. This is Nick Beat. We're talking to. 
the lovely Emma Town of Maryland Lightstone. Hope you're enjoying the Hal Show, which is on 89.5 FM on CIUT, coming out of Hart House, uh, third story studio tonight. Sometimes we're down in the main studio, and I hope you're uh, enjoying the show. If you want to talk to our guests at all at any point uh, in the next half an hour, you can call 416 946 7000. My tech Robert will take the call, and then we'll, we'll uh, put you on the air. You can talk to our, our guest, Marilyn Lightstone. Marilyn has an unbelievable, accomplished career that I, I totally am. You're like looking through the list of all the, the movies, characters she's play, praised. One of, one of them, in praise of older women, was not only um, a, a, a got a lot of attention, but was enormously controversial for Canadian Yes, film. it was. It almost didn't get shown. It was supposed to be the premiere at the... The, um, the Toronto International Film Festival until the very last moment we didn't know whether or not the cops would come in and you shut should. us down. And you know now when you look at it, it's reconsidering the stuff that's on the air on television, everyone in film, film theaters is, is so really innocuous and kind of mild and, and sweet and innocent in its way. How did you feel about being in it though? Were you uncomfortable at all being part of uh, a slightly risque for the time? And no piece? I wasn't because um, it was written by a, a, a wonderful a writer and uh, great actors, and um, also I, I. It was a test of my mettle, you know, whether I could handle it. Of course, I worked out for about a year beforehand, just in, just in case I had to show a little bit more of myself than I was used to showing. But as it turned out, that wasn't a great deal, you know, after all at all. So that that was okay. But um, I, I just loved working in film there's a there's a kind of acting you you get to do in film you you can't do on the stage when you're on the stage which i also love performing and in, incidentally uh you have to project everything to the back row so everything is is kind of just whipped up a bit you know it's it's larger than life and yet it still has to be realistic and acceptable as life but in film you get to do something which i've always called eyelash acting you can do the absolute minimum in fact you just you think a thought, you think the thought the character is thinking, and then it's up to the camera to, to pick it up, and they and they do. So you can be as subtle as you, you really want to be, and you can be subtle in film, and that's what's the power of film, you know, to, to be able to do, be minimal you know, in what you have to do to get the emotion of the character. But how do you know when to do that? Well, if you're an actor, you know how. Oh, <laughs> it's just, okay. That's just what we do when we go to work. It's, okay. you know, it's, it's kind of, without that, you really, you know, you better choose another profession. I think Brando called that no acting required. That's but. right. You just have to be, really. And as I say, if you have a good director and particularly a good cinematographer, they will pick up on what you're doing. Okay. This is Nick B. We're talking to Marilyn Whitestone. If you just joined us now, it's uh, about uh, 15 minutes after 10. I hope you're enjoying the, the Howl Radio Show with Nick Beat. Remember, next week, uh, my co-host Nancy Bulls will be in the hot seat uh, with her guests. And in two weeks, uh, I've got another amazing guest, which is the niece of Michael Jackson. She will be on the show to talk about her uncle, his death, the, how it impacted on her. And she's got a pop music video career that she's going to be talking about. I want to thank her uncle, Cedric Jackson, for setting it up and that's in a couple of weeks and then we're going to also be launching a song law of attraction by uh, a friend of mine laura larock she's got a new video out by the same name and we'll be playing that track right now we're in the studio with marilyn uh, lightstone a little later we'll be talking on the phone to uh, matt jolly who's got a cd release coming up on november 14th at the hard rock cafe seven o'clock is the time and uh, that's being put on uh, and thanks to eric alper for setting up that game I'm just wondering, you've done television too. Cagney mm -hmm. and Lacey is on your list of credits. Mm -hmm. what, what's the obvious difference as far as what you've got to prepare and what you've got to do? Is it just faster process? It's faster. You don't okay. have the time. You don't usually have, you know, three, four, or five takes, whatever. And of course, the bigger the budget, the more takes you have. But uh, Canadian production generally has less of a budget than you'd find in a big a big Hollywood film but in television you know you better get it in a couple of takes because uh, there just isn't the time you've got a limited shooting time whereas in a film you've got you know weeks and weeks and generally you've got to get something in the can when week 10 days whatever you got to get a whole show in the can I'm just wondering do you miss the earlier times or are you nostalgic that way or no you're the person that lives in the present I do person. actually and I, I live no. in the present and hopefully in the future you know thinking ahead but I think back on the old days, you know, at the CBC radio building on Jarvis Street and the kind of atmosphere it 
<laughs> seedy though it was at times with the mice running around. But um, I remember Essa Young, you know, the, the old radio drama directors. Yeah. I did a lot of radio drama when I first finished theater school and came to Toronto. And it, it was a wonderful training ground doing radio drama, having to get really a training for the kind of work we do now because you have to express everything just with your voice. And um, I'm just sorry that the CBC no longer does that sort of thing, or if they do, certainly not very often. No, why don't they? And then I don't Who know they knows? Do. Why does the CBC do what the CBC does? I don't know. <laughs> Far be it from me to sort of attempt to explain what people wiser and older and smarter than me have failed at. So I will go there. Okay, let's talk about the radio station where you are currently. Mm -hmm. How long have you been there for? Oh, gosh, years. Um, I'm trying to think. Um, I kind of for, I think of things in terms of decades. If someone would say, well, when was that done? Or when was that shot? I'd say, well, in the 70s or the 80s. So, I don't know, um, six, seven years, something like that. So six or seven years? So I, think, I think it's as long as that, yeah. And it was, it was oh, it's six, uh, seven. We're seeing seven. seven. Yes, I mean, I'm getting okay. a little, for a little Moses help there. from Moses and I remember sitting outside of our little partition here. Seven, thanks, Moses. Okay. Moses bought that station. Yes, he did. Now, uh, wh why? Why did he buy that station? Because he loved it. He loves classical music. Okay. And uh, just and listens to it. And uh, when he heard it, um, he said, "I want to I get that station." And it, uh, he sort of tried to get it for years when it wasn't for sale, and then finally it was, and there he is. But um, I think, to a greater great degree, though, uh, he and the, and the people that he's hired to work there have really remade the station. It was always yeah. a good station. I think it's great. I, th I think it's wonderful. I, of course, I'm totally biased, but uh, I listen to it all the time. <laughs> okay. We're talking about, of course, uh, 96.3. You know, what, what's the call letters for that? Oh, gosh. <laughs> I never <laughs> think of... Maybe okay. we better Moses? get Moses in here. Moses. Oh, dear. CFMX. Is that it, CFMX. Moses? Oh, oh. I'm misreading. I... <laughs> He's... CFMZ? C CFMZ. <laughs> you know, I never think of, never, of course CBC, yes, but uh, I always think of the, the numbers. The, when I think of radio stations with, um, with, with letters, I think of like CJD and CFCS, That's which right. are the radio That's stations right. I used to listen to when I was a kid in Montreal. This is Nick Beat. I hope you're enjoying the interview with Marilyn Lightstone. A little later, uh, we're going to be playing a track from Matt Jolly's new uh, CD release, he was formerly with a rock group called Mobile. He's got a big CD release that I will be attending uh, 7 o'clock at the Hard Rock Cafe. want to thank Eric Alper of E1 Music. Thanks, Eric, again for, uh, for uh, getting me in on this and on the interview. We're talking to Marilyn Lightstone about her career. Marilyn, you're also, you, you read poetry on the air, but you, ne it's, you never read your own. Do you have any poetry at I, all? I do, though? actually, but I, I've written poems... I don't know why. Um, I think it'd be presumptuous. I mean, there are many poet, poets far better than me. Also, my, my poems tend to be either lyrics for songs or just kind of random thoughts. And um, I, I just thought it would be kind of egotistic to read my own poetry when you have such a wonderful selection. And who do you like to, to read? What, what, who's some of your favorite authors, well, writers? I. I don't read the sort of the old English poetry that I, I used to, you know, study in school, Longfellow and Tennyson. They're, they're too long and they're, they're kind of dry from this point of view. That's true. Uh, my, I think probably my favorite poetry uh, is Billy Collins, okay. who uh, at one time was the Poet Laureate of the United States. And uh, he writes prose poetry, I mean, not rhyme verse, which is not my favorite. And each one of his poems tells a story of the human condition, and uh, I know they just speak to me. And he was very much influenced by the Oriental poets, and a lot of our, you know, really uh, famous um, North American and European contemporary poets have been influenced by the Oriental poets. And I read a lot of them on the, on the air too, because they're they're four, you know, they're either they're three lines or they're five lines, uh, they're tanka or you know whatever is five lines, um, or what can I say? They're kind of like little film scripts, you know? It'll be, it, because their their language is pictographic, I think this is reason why every little poem is like a little painting or like a, a scene from a movie. It'll be like, well, just to sort of paraphrase, like, you know, the, the, the fisherman lowers his rod into the water. The moon shines overhead. 
a silver fish sl slips through the wave. And then suddenly you can do, just kind of see it, you know, and, and it's moving. It's not a static thing. You can see it, it's moving. So, and wonderfully erotic stuff too, the oriental poets. I didn't um, know that actually. Oh, lots and lots and lots of really sexy poems. And stuff written 1,500 years ago. Well, we see we have an oriental gentleman sitting there behind the screen at the, at the controls, and he's listening. Um, yes, stuff that's written 500 BC. Yeah. 500 AD, 1,000 years old, 15 years old, and just as modern as you and I sitting here in front of these microphones. And some of the people I could recommend are Han Shan, Li Po, Lao Tzu. Those, those are some of the major poets, I think, from that time. Yeah, those are all the time period mm -hmm. that, uh, that I've uh, studied a long time ago, thanks to my teacher at the time, who was Alan Sutterfield. We're talking to Marilyn Lightstone on Howl with Nick Bead. Hope you're enjoying the show and a little later we'll be talking to Matt Jolly and talking to him about his new CD release and a couple of tracks from his album and I uh, hope you're en enjoying the show. Marilyn's got an amazing, I mean the credits go on and on and on it's and on. <laughs> yeah, but you're also you're accomplished. Like a lot of people don't have these accomplishments. One of the accomplishments she won was a Canadian Film Award winner for Best Actress. Mm -hmm. And what was that like? That was in 76. Oh, it was a thrill. It, it was a thrill. That was for Lies My Father Told Me. And um, it's always nice to be recognized. This was very early days in the Canadian Film Awards. The, the, the award itself was different. It was a, a little um, replica of a statue by Saul Etrog. And uh, it was nowhere near as glitzy as it is now. I don't even remember if it was filmed, you know, kind of it was on live. There wasn't a big entertainment component. But it, it was wonderful because um, the film was an important film, you know. And it, it continues to resonate because, because it's a period piece. It doesn't date. And uh, although the prints that were going around got to be very ragged, there's a brand new crisp print that's available now that's being used. <laughs> and um, because it's a family, everybody can relate. Of course, all the great you know stories of the theater are all about families. Whether it's it's King Lear or Oedipus Rex or um, or The Godfather, it's always about families, and that was really the strength of Lies as well. Okay, this is Nick. We were talking to Marilyn Lightstone. I hope you're enjoying uh, our conversation with her, and uh, I, I really enjoyed Marilyn doing the the fluffy tales poem. That was <laughs> that just blew me away because she did it with. Complete authority, and she just seen the book, so that, that that just blows me away. But anyway, that's what really what an actor's job is. You do have to be on the mark, cold reading or not, and do it. Frankly, I think cold readings are often the most effective, because your 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 ego and your intellect doesn't get a chance, don't get a chance to get in the way of your natural instincts. So sometimes the first time you do something is the best you'll ever do it. Unfortunately, because you have to do it many times over, certainly in front of a camera. Have you had directors, whether in television or film or, st or st not stage, but within those contexts where, yeah, they're giving, making you do it over and over and over again? Well, you're lucky you get a chance to make it over and over. That really? means you get a chance to make it better and better. The problem okay. is, is uh, and this has happened too, say, you know, everybody, they've done the, the, the master shot, they've done everybody else's close-up, and then finally they're running out of time, and it's your time for your close-up, but okay, you do it once, right? okay, that's it, wrap, you know, and say, but I'd like to do it one more time, I'd like to do it, no, sorry, no time. So hmm. really, we, we don't mind doing it over and over again. It's, it's not having the time to work things through that are, are difficult. Marilyn Brando is really famous for making the statement that everybody acts. So what? What's the, why am I getting paid <laughs> when everybody? My dog is acting right now. He True, pretends he you, likes me. You have to do it on demand. That's the thing. And that's there, the trick. That's, that's, that's the, the trick. And you have to do it on demand, and you have to repeat it over and over again. And each time it has to be as if you've never done it before, ever, ever, ever. Who was one that's of your favorite actors? Oh God. Or influential for you? You know. Of course, I, I like the Meryl Streep's and that, but I, I don't really think in terms of favorite actors, really. I, I, never, I never really have. I've never sort of done that. I'll have favorite writers, you know, but not favorite Who actors. are your favorite writers? Well, I'm a rather frivolous reader. I, I like... Uh, I love your honesty. I like the literary mystery, you know. Okay. They are mystery, but... So I like Elizabeth George. I, I like, you know, all, all the old guys that used to be around and... Uh, they're just wonderful. Um, uh, P.D. James, for example. Yeah. Um, 
smart, smart people who know how to write well, but who choose to write mysteries. I, I'm an escapist reader. I, I don't read to uh, to educate myself or um, anything like that. I just read to get myself into another world. And, and once I'm there, uh, I will all stay up all night reading to finish a book that I've been reading, even though my eyes, you know, are kind of really just a little slit and I know I have to get up at eight o'clock in the morning, but still like, I just have to finish the book. And I've been that way my whole life. Really? Kid. Oh yes. I'd, um, I go to the library on Friday and I take out as many books as you're allowed to take. I think it was five. And I'd go home and I'd start to read on the Chesterfield, as we called it, the sofa, which was in our dining room. And my mom would say, go outside, go and play with our friends. And I, I, and I'd say, well, you know, when I finish this chapter, and then one chapter would lead to another, and eventually I would never go outside to play. And then if Sunday night came around and I hadn't finished the book I was reading, I used my acting ability as a kid. I say, Mom, I, I have a sore throat and I can't go, I don't want to go to school today. And my mother said, okay, you know, stay in bed. And of course, I, I finish, um, oh, what did he, um, well, Andy Green Gables was one, for example. But I had a lot of <laughs> time spent on Andy Green Gables later in my life. But I remember, you know, I had to, I had to stay on to. Um, were you later in Annie Green Gables? Didn't you act in Annie yes, Green Gables? Yes, yes I did. Was, didn't that feel yes, a little I bit did. almost weird that you had read it? Well, in every kid, it? every girl in Canada read Annie Green Gables, really. They did? Oh, okay, I yes. You see it read. Some guys, too. I mean, some, I'll, okay. I'll still get, um, I'll get emails from um, people all over the world because the show was sold all over the world, mm -hmm. uh, saying how much it had meant to them as children. And some of them are guys, to my surprise. It was a Russian guy, you know, he's about 26 years old, and he had a green gables meant the world to him, so well, well, there you go. That blows my mind. Yeah, it's a totally. good book. This is Nick B. We're talking to Marilyn Lightstone. Uh, we'll be breaking for an ad, I assume, pretty soon, within the next minute or so, and hope you're enjoying our, uh, our show. And like I said, a little later on quarter two, we're going to be talking to uh, pop star uh, Matt Jolly, talking about his new CD release. He used to be in the band Mobile. And uh, he's since left it to do a solo career. So, yeah, that's going to be absolutely amazing talking to him, talking about his show that's coming up at the Hard Rock Cafe. And again, thanks to Eric Alper for that interview. And just got to thank Marilyn for, for this interview. Um, I contacted Marilyn, and uh, I think I tried months ago and then lost the thread. Yes, we're um, Facebook friends. Yeah, we're Facebook that's friends. That's how we and make that's, contact. This is where Facebook actually is a nice way of making connections with people you it, maybe no, normally never have met. You know, even. first of all, people sort of deride me. Oh, it's a waste of time, blah, blah, blah. Well, I say Facebook depends on um, who your friends are. And uh, many of my friends are actors and writers and musicians. And they always have something interesting to say. I've, I've learned many things in terms of breaking news and you know issues, worldwide issues. Uh, come up on Facebook before they hit the news and uh, I find it quite fascinating and um, also I've made contact with people that I've worked with you know in, in New York or California and we've lost touch and people I liked and we've made touch again you know made contact again through uh, through fa Facebook and so I'm, I'm a big fan. This is Nick Bieber, Tony Marilyn Lester, hope you're enjoying the show. Marilyn, before we, uh, I guess it's time to break for that, isn't it, Robert? Okay. We'll break for an ad, and then we'll be back with the rest of our Howl show with Marilyn Lightstone. Hope you're enjoying it. We'll be back in a minute. You're great. <laughs> now just wind me up and I'll talk. No, but you're so well-spoken. It's just a pleasure. Because some people I have, they're not used to it. They get very no, shy. I know. Well, yeah. I'm not shy. I'm reserved, actually. I'm quite a reserved person, but I'm not shy. <laughs> Okay, we're back. This is Nick Beat on Howl so Radio. Hope you're enjoying our show, Howl, which is spoken word, music, and art, and literature. Uh, it's gotten a little bit more celebrity based over over the over the years, just because uh, I'm getting a lot of publicists in the United States that want their clients to be on the show, which is a nice kudo for our station and for us. And Marilyn actually has a show on 96.3. Yes, and, uh, 11 to what? 1 in the morning. That's what I wanted to talk yes. about. Um, no commercials except for one break at, at midnight. Uh, you can also hear us on um, classical963fm.com on the internet, which is great because I've, I have listeners through the internet all over the world. 
from China and Finland and, and England and Greece and Italy and Buenos Aires. And uh, I, I love that. I love that. Are there, do you ever get, okay, there's a lot of kudos for what you do. Do you ever get people that aren't happy with what you do and how yes. they handle it? Yes, there are some people who don't like poetry. <laughs> and they say, too yeah. much poetry, oh, stop, yeah, stop. Some? We, we just want to hear the music, not with the poetry, blah, blah, blah. So I say, well, you know, you're, you're a free person. You're, you know, just turn it off, whatever. But Do you like classical music? I love it. I absolutely love it. I, I find, actually, that's what I listen to in 98% of the time. Um, I, I also love the great American songbook kind of stuff. I, I learned all the songs when I was a kid. I love to sing them. and. Uh, uh, but the kind of contemporary music, I don't know. I, it's, I, I find a lot of the music I hear is overproduced. All I, I can't hear the singers. I like yeah. lyrics. You see, I like the words. So I want to hear the lyrics, and I find I, I, can't, I can't hear the singers. Can't hear the sing I can't understand what they're saying. Even if I like what they're saying, I can't hear them. And too much production, too much you know, heavy stuff covering the voices. But um, no, I, I like music um, in which the singers are featured rather than just going along for the ride, which I seem to be in many cases. No, you're a singer and you're also a songwriter. Yes. yes your your songs, where, where are they? I mean, it's a banal question, but where, where are they coming from? They come from personal experience, imagination, they are. or They both? are. There's something that I, I want to say. And uh, one that's particularly meaningful to, to me is one that you'll hear a lot, certainly on 96.3 and on, on Vision TV. And it's a song that I wrote for the holiday season that's just coming up, and it's called The Light Shines All Over the World. And it stems from my, my experience as a child in which um, if you didn't go pro to a parochial school in, in Montreal, you went to a school run by the Protestant School Board of Greater Montreal. Sure. And uh, we learned all the Christmas carols and all the hymns in our classes. And I thought, gosh, you know, when it's kind of December came around, wouldn't it be nice if everybody could sing songs that were meaningful, you know, to all the traditions? Even yeah. though I know all the, all the lyrics to the Christmas carols, more so than my Christian friends. So uh, I decided to write one. And um, um, there have been various versions of it, sung with various choirs, male choirs, kids' choirs. Uh, we did a version on Vision last year in a concert setting. I'm going to do another one this coming season um, with the uh, Ocas de la Jeunesse Youth Orchestra and a bunch of children's choirs all massed together wow. in a new arrangement for orchestra. And I'll be singing with them, and uh, we're going to record this um, at Vision for the the Christmas season. So um, I'm looking forward to I'm looking forward to the new arrangement. But it's it's been quite a trip. Are you? Is there any difference in your approach to, as far as being nervous, or maybe you're not, to acting or to, when you're singing? Do you feel less yes. nervous or more nervous? <laughs> more nervous because. Yeah, me too. Because when I sing, I, the songs that I, I write, stupid me, I write with a huge range, so they go from very, very, very low to very, very low. And I'm always concerned that, you know, making that switch, you know, kind of in your, where it has to come from, you have to make it quite easily and naturally. So it still traumatizes me a bit. I know. I just did a concert just recently at, at the Transact of Max Layton and uh, Robert Priest. And yeah, I've got songs where I just realized. They go, they're like up and down. It's but that's where scary. they want to go. You know, yeah, that's true. Yeah, songwriting is interesting because when you write, you write a poem, you just you you make it as tight and as as pared down as you can. It's just a step away from being music poetry to begin yeah. with. It's just one little shove, and it's a song. It's true. Yeah. It's true. This is Nick B. We're talking to Marilyn Lightstone. Hope you're enjoying the show on CIUT 89.5 FM. And of course, uh, we're on Star Satellite 826, and we're also on Rogers Cable Galaxy Channel 946, not visually, obviously, but audio. And uh, we're also on the internet at www.cat.fm, so you can hear us all over the place. And hope you are enjoying the show. We've got a, a few minutes left in our interview with uh, Marilyn Lightstone. And, and thanks, Marilyn, again, for, for being uh, part of our, our show. Uh, I, I have an almost permanent smile on my face while I'm doing this interview. Because I can't believe Marilyn's here. So I'm really happy to have her. Only a few more minutes? Heck. Five more minutes? Six more minutes, maybe? Um, really, really pleased to have her here. And, uh, of course, uh, I have never, I've never met. I met your husband, like I was saying to Moses earlier, but ten years ago. Your partner, sorry. Your partner. Uh, and, uh, which was a, a real pleasure. Uh, but it's, I've never, I've never met you. I've heard a lot about you. It's good to know. Thank you, That's, Nick. Hey, uh, and it's been all good, too, right? <laughs> uh, 
It's terrible when it's not, but it's been so all, all good. Can I ask you, there's been a, a little bit of uh, criticism, I don't know if you've ever heard it, that if, if your husband wasn't Moses Neimer, there's certain opportunities you might not have gotten. Do, do you agree with that, disagree with that? Is that well, of course it's my, true. Of course it's true. Um, Moses knows what I can do, and he makes use of it. Okay. And I'm very glad to be made use of in a, you know, in a uh, creative way. So there you go. Of course, look, this is a business like any other, and yeah. uh, you have to have contacts. And sometimes they come about quite by chance, and sometimes they come about because you pursue them, and I've never been particularly good at that. But um, my comfort in this is knowing that I can deliver. So yes, can. I, I think the bad thing is when someone can't deliver and, you know, and gets a big push you know, into, the, into the limelight because they have connections. Oh, you, you can definitely... Uh prove your stuff there's, there's no doubt about it because uh, you do such a diversity I mean you also do sta the stage now is that your first love or well that was my first love that okay. was sort of got me into the you know the realm of being an actress but um, I haven't done theater for a long time but I would very much like to I've done dramatic readings another one's coming up this uh, this Christmas at the Church of the Redeemer. It'll be my, my fourth season reading The Christmas Carol and uh, oh, with wow. R.H. Thompson and Nick Mancuso and Lorena McKinnon and R.H. Thompson. We're gonna have a great time. Can I ask you, do, do you find it, uh, you were saying earlier that you, you know, you were singing songs you almost had to, that was within a Christian context. But is, don't you find it amazing that really it's Jews that wrote the Bible? Of course, wrote the Bible and wrote White Christmas. Yeah, well, right, and actually a lot of like, rip, Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer and all these contemporary ones were written by Jewish guys True. too. But even so, the ones that yeah. weren't, even the Christmas carols, you know, Heart the Herald Angels Sing Silent Night, they're beautiful music. They they're they beautiful music. And, you know, I have a few bones to pick with uh, religion. Uh, as Which is? Uh, we, uh, much too long for five much minutes. Much too long? But yeah. one thing I will say is that because of religion, because of the church, we have wonderful music and also some amazing art. So I do thank the church for that, if not for my chance. True. Talking about art, just uh, we've got a few minutes left. Uh, you are also a visual artist. Yes. You are, you're also a photographer. Yes, I am. Although I must tell you, uh, after 13 years of being in my studio and really loving it, and kind of finally being able to do live a part of my life that I put aside because I wanted to be an actress, um, I was able to fulfill that. But I closed my studio at the end of July because I just have a feeling in my bones that there are different things coming up and the studio really kind of takes a lot of time and attention. So I want mm -hmm. my, my creative self to be free to pursue new opportunities and uh, hopefully some more acting. Definitely. Now what kind of acting, what kind of acting context would you like to be in? Oops. Oops. Well as I told you, I, I love, Sorry I love about film, that. I love television, I love the, the close up medium, but also I love to do a really juicy part on the stage. There's something about being in the theater and working in the theater that, um, again, you don't reach as many people as you do when you're on television. That's but true. it's something very special to to an actor. And uh, uh, even the one you're on a film set or a television set, you know, there's a crew all around you. So you have an audience. They're watching what you're doing. And they're a very discerning audience. But there's something about standing on stage all by yourself, you know, with your other actors. But I mean, you know, kind of no cameras, no, no sound people, whatever. And just having to sort of make the people back in the 90th row cry or laugh or whatever. That's, that's challenging and it, it's thrilling as well. Did you ever have any problem um, with the actual auditioning, seeking audition part of it? You said that you have a hard time seeking the, the yes. job, not yes, getting the job, but seeking it. Um, Are you just a bit shy? Or is no, that, is it's that just that you know you have to go, you have to sort of make yourself available to parties and this and that. I'm That's not true. a party lady, really. I, I, I like, I don't like, I never, never like the business of the business, and that's part of it, sort of making yourself known and being in contact with this person, that person, all for the sake of being able to, you know, to sort of get on the decision. I, I've always found that hard, which is stupid because you, you have to do it really if you want to get ahead. But um, good parts are the part. People say, well, what kind of, what part? What is your favorite part? What part would you like to play? And I say, I really don't want to do anything that's ever been done before by anyone else. I really like to create new parts that have never been done before, new characters. That's what about writing, writing a part for yourself? You know, I, I, I've written a book. It's going to be available uh, as an ebook very shortly. It's called Rogues and Vagabonds. And it's written, uh, it's not my autobiography, but it's very much out of my own personal experience. 
but I've never had the inclination to write a play, and I don't really not even like a one woman play. show. No, sort of okay. <laughs> no, very weird, very mm -hmm. weird indeed. But um, no, the best parts are the parts that no one has ever done. And on that note, I've got to say thank you so much. I think it's been fun. It has yeah. been. It's been fantastic, and the time is absolutely. I know it's a cliche, but it has really, really whizzed by. It has. It has, and uh, I want to thank Marilyn very, very much for, for coming in here. It's been a great her. pleasure. Hey, it's, it's been great, and hopefully uh, I can have a nice pick with Marilyn uh, during the break. We're going to now play a, a song by Matt Jolie, and then we'll be back talking to Matt himself about his CD release at the uh, Hard Rock Cafe. Again, thanks to my friend Eric Alpert, E1 Music, for, for that. Uh, we'll be back with more of Howl Enjoy the Music by Matt Shelley. Cool. That went great. Ta -da. That went great. Wow. No, just I say, wind me up and I'll talk. <laughs> You've done so many things, Mary. I can't get over it. You know, I do all the things I did when I was a kid. When I was a kid, I did all those very same things. I sang songs and I wrote plays. What, no, played every, yes, I made up plays. I wrote stories. I painted. And uh, I, that's been my thing. You just to do all those things as a grown-up person as well. Wow. Yeah, you know, it's, it's wow, fun. Wow, 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 wow. It's fun. Um, do you yeah. mind if I have, Penn, do you mind taking a picture of Marilyn and me and then Marilyn, me, and Moses at some point? If that's yeah, okay? Yeah, During the break? Yeah. Because okay, I don't want to okay. hold them up if, if you guys want to know. Oh, I think Moses just wants to eat. He wants to go to Chinatown. Oh, sorry. Alright. I've got a problem. Hi, the phone's not working. Um, okay, then I'll just talk about the, uh, I'll talk about him.